Hello, Remden Most High God, and welcome to another edition of the Kingdom Intelligence Briefing. Kiabe's purpose is to provide an intelligence briefing for the body of Messiah that will both inform and empower the remnant in the last days. We want you to know that you're not alone. There are more of us than you realize, and the ranks of the resistance is growing all around the world against Mystery Babylon. This is episode number 344. I'm your host, Dr. Michael Lake. I'm in the KIB studio today with the love of my life, Mary Lou. Hi, everybody. So good to be here and talking to you guys. We love you guys and appreciate everything you do. We appreciate your prayers. Um, I've got reports of, of where we've asked for prayer and the, and the results and people thanking us for praying. Thank you so much. Your prayers are powerful, and we ask you to continue that. Thank you for praying for the conference. Um, Mike had a great time and just had a lot of encouraging stories when he got home. So things are moving, guys. I was in. I was really blessed by the amount of young people that were there, and many of them come to our table and and uh, shared what God was doing in their lives and how God has used our podcasts and, and different things. And uh, Mary, this is one thing we've been praying for a long time: is that God would raise up this next generation. Yes. And uh, there is a fine, strapping bunch of young people. Oh, I can't wait to meet that, them. I'm uh, hoping they plan on coming to the conferences. <laughs> I tell you what, they love God, and you, you can, it's not just in the words they say, you can see you can it in their see eyes, it. you can yeah, see it in right. them. And the conference was awesome, really enjoyed myself. Uh, all of the sessions were absolutely outstanding. And I want to remind everyone, if you weren't able to make it down to Dallas, you can still uh, do the live streaming where you can, uh, I think it's now called Video On Demand once it's over rather than live streaming, or uh, they are going to be making DVDs available. And there was so much information that was disseminated. I personally plan on uh, on buying a set of the DVDs just so that I can go back through some of the sessions because there's been, there was a few of them, Mary. Like with David Hodges, uh-huh. I kind of felt like I was trying to drink out of a fire hose when I, because <laughs> oh, I mean, it, it was just information. a lot of information, a lot of things going on. Uh, there were a lot of them that were, that were very inspirational too. But uh, that's one of the things I like about the conference is that you get all this intelligence data at the same time, the Spirit of God is moving, and, and God is empowering, God is encouraging, God's doing a lot of things in the midst, and uh, Jamie Walden just knocked it out of the park, and I was glad to see him and his family there. They're just so sweet, and uh, just really, really had a good time. Well, I'm so glad that everything went well, too. No no trouble on the travels, and everything was calm here at home, Had had time to pray, and just planning for the the conference center, and I think that's yeah. what we're. I think that's what God is is instructing us to move toward focusing on and and getting this book done for you. And so we're going to be making a few changes, but hey, God's going to back everything up, and we're going to see mighty things happen. Is yes, it? It's all exciting, and the the closer they get, the more work that's being done there on the center, the more excited I'm getting. So yeah, it's it's, it's going to be it's great. Really, guys. it's really exciting, and uh, just to see something that. Uh, uh, that God gives the vision and begin giving, giving the vision and just being obedient. Yeah. Uh, I mean, we in this situation we were obedient before we had the vision. Yeah, that's for sure. And, and to see it <laughs> and see it begin developing and, and things is just really exciting. That uh, I, I think that we're in a a situation in, in the next year or so that we are going to be seeing some profound kingdom moments. And uh, one of the things that I began praying after I, I met these uh, uh, younger people down in Dallas is that I began interceding that God would begin releasing signs and wonders through his people once again. Not only that we would see the the signs and wonders, the word of God talks about in Moses that it said the children of Israel saw the wonders of God, but Moses understood the ways of God. And I believe that there's going to be young people that understand the ways of God because those ways produce the wonders. Yeah, that's right. And uh, and that's one of the things I released. And in fact, uh, uh, I wasn't planning on it. God had me release the fire of God on the audience and a double a double fresh anointing on the young people, because they've got a they they're, they're going to be. I, I want to see them surpass anything that any ministry down there has been able to do. And Mary, I, at that final generation, I think are going to be like Navy SEALs in the kingdom mm-hmm. of God. Mm-hmm. And so it's, it was just such a blessing. Oh, I can't wait to meet him. It's so exciting and encouraging, isn't it? I, um, As I was praying for the podcast, I heard God clearly say to me, uh, 
my people are stiff necked. <laughs> and oh, I, my stomach just kind of sunk because I knew what that meant. Um, oh, yeah, in the Bible, that's not good at all. No, the in Exodus 32 9, now this was after, you know, all these crazy things happened when Moses was up on the mountain and came down, and, and the Lord said unto Moses, I have seen this people, and behold, it is a stiff necked people. And of course, they had. Uh, done a lot of bad stuff <laughs> you know they they were making the golden calf they um and of course moses intercession uh was helping that's for sure i think they did just you know it'd been hard for for god not to just wipe them out well um, at one point god said listen moses i'm going to wipe them all out instead of with abraham i'm just going to start with you and and moses interceded otherwise if he hadn't of the uh, the children of Israel would have ceased to exist that day. Well, and the uh, there still the ringleaders were were executed. Yeah, and I think that shows how important it is for those that are are leading and instructing people and and moving them in a way the judgment's more severe. Um, boy, and then you know I looked in <laughs> Acts seven where. Um, Stephen said, Ye stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, you do always resist the Holy Ghost as your fathers did, so do ye. And they stoned him for it. <laughs> yeah. So the, And they were the ones that killed the prophets. And so I was, you know, I was praying about this. And in Psalm 32, 8 9, it says, uh, The Lord says, I will instruct thee and teach thee in the way which thou shalt go. I will guide thee with mine eye. Be ye not as a horse or as a mule, which have no understanding, whose mouth must be held in with bit and bridle, lest they come near unto thee. And uh, there's, you know, good instruction on, on what to do. Of course, God instructed his people all through the word, and and the stiff-necked would rise up, and they would just refuse to turn. And God started showing me about, um, you know, if you have a stiff neck in the natural, like, like if you ever wake up and your neck's stiff, and you, you just, you'll resist turning your head because it's uncomfortable. <laughs> and I thought, how many times do we resist the prompting of the Holy Spirit because it's uncomfortable? And I tell you, we repented for <clears throat> being stiff-necked about the conference center. Yeah. I mean, I kept looking over there. I could, I could feel the Holy Spirit leading me to look over there. And, um, and, we, and I just thought, oh, because it, in my mind I was thinking, Oh God, you're gonna have us have a huge congregation there, and oh God, we've been through so much of this stuff, and you know who's gonna come, God? If we open those doors for a congregation, you know who's gonna come in there, don't you? <laughs> and so, um, it was really, it was probably more difficult for you than for me because you'd kind of settled into the building we had and just thought, okay, I'm gonna write books, and I had plans, <laughs> <laughs> and but I just kept, every time we'd go by, I'd, I'd oh, be prompted. Me too. And so we we had to repent for being stiff necked. That was stiff necked. That we did. No, we don't want to leave our comfortable zone. We're going to go over here where it could be uncomfortable. And then when it it became clear what God wanted us to do with it, the well, then joy came. And yeah. you know, but, but I, was, I remember just driving by it, and it's like God says, "Look at the building." Oh no! <laughs> yeah. And so, it, it, if if I had had a dollar for every time that happened, I could I could take a very large group to Olive Garden for lunch. You know, it's. But at, at the same time, God, sometimes, and, and this, this is something we need to realize, sometimes God is preparing us for a vision that we're not ready for yet. Yeah. God is trying to set well, the and, stage. And we had the money to buy it. Yeah. You know, which, he, which is a, a, a practically wise because this day and age, having money sitting in the bank and, you know, it's not safe. It's vapor with the, work, yeah. the way that the economy's going and their plans. And, you know, you look at why, okay, now why did God so far ahead, you know, because we've been now working on this thing for a couple of years. Well, at the same time, there was so much work that needed to be done. It was going to take that long to, you know, raise the funds, get it done, as well as to get through, you know, my thick head, uh, just exactly what God was wanting to do. And so God in his perfect time, even though at, at first we were stiff-necked, down, uh, and this is one of the things that we learned, uh, I think, down in, in Dixon when we were going through all the things where the occult were trying to kill us, 
You know, when you're in, in, in a sense, it's like being in a foxhole in a firefight. Whenever you're given an order, you obey it because you know that it's, it's, it's for your best. And God began showing us one thing after another after another, and we were so desperate, we were willing to change anything to yeah, bring it and that, to bring that, it in line. And I, I think that taught us that gave us an edge because because we were trying to stay alive. Yeah. We knew that there were our lives were on the line, and so we were we're open to God show us what to do, show us what to change, and and we can never sit in judgment of people that are having a hard time changing things. Because it's hard to change sometimes. It's, it's very hard, especially in the atmosphere that we have today and the church that, that's been established today. It's very difficult because for the, the and this is just the truth, for the, the church as a whole, it's shallow. Yeah. It's, it's go, <laughs> and, and this is just the truth. I'm not putting down any person or anything. I think it's easy to get in the flow of this. And I think it's easy for ministries to go in the flow because of, that's what the people are desiring. They want big, hyped-up praise and worship. And in the middle of that, I mean, I've seen great anointed songs and things. It's not like everything's just bad. It's just somehow Satan's got enough of a um, foothold that that he's causing us to to miss the mark, I believe. You know, because because we are yeah. headed into territory, and I don't believe it's as bad as everybody else is saying. I don't believe we're on the on the doorstep of nuclear war, and that's the great. I don't think we're that close. I think it's a time that God is going to try to unstiff neck His people. <laughs> I mean, the two things that I'm thinking of is as we were preparing for this, and one of them is a story from Rod Parsley way back when they were just in that little white church in Columbus, Ohio, and I've actually been by there and, and seen it, and they in the building, a building next to it that was like four times its size, which is now a youth center. When he was in that little church, and God began to deal with him that, uh, you know, like uh, you know, like the new, some of the newer songs back when it wasn't just the hymnal. Uh-huh. And, of course, there were Hosanna songs and everything else, and God began to deal with him, saying, listen, let's, let's add some of these new songs. And there was a such a ruckus that half his congregation left. Oh, just just over that. Well, we've known congregations that split over the hymnals. <laughs> what oh, hymnals yeah. they have? Well, I, you know, I heard one story that uh, from just at, at here the Watchman that there was a church split over the fact they moved the piano from the right side of the church to the left side of the church to accommodate something different. And but he was obedient to God. And now you can go up and you can sit in a five thousand seat auditorium instead of a hundred twenty seat church. Because he was obedient, but there was half the congregation he had back then were stiff-necked and couldn't sense what God was doing. And I, th- I think them sometimes that's even, uh, you know, I, I jokingly tell people, you know, I, I was raised at first to be a Baptist minister, and sometimes Baptists will cloak their um, some of their reality in jokes, like, you know, Baptists do not uh, grow by multiplication, they grow by division. But one of the ones I think was the most serious was that uh, the will of God can only be overturned by two-thirds majority vote. And you actually see that happen in congregations. That, you know, God is trying to move one way, and because they're stiff-necked, Mary, it's like God is saying, listen, I love you. There are some things that you're going to need to change for either what I need you to do in the future, or you don't know the the behemoth attack the enemy's getting ready to have on your ministry. And so I'm trying to get you to change now to be prepared and they overrule it because it's it's a democratic church, and they have lost the truth that when when you have a church where you can vote in, that vote is not about what you want. That vote is about you went home and you prayed and you heard what God wanted. Mm-hmm. And we we've lost that truth. And how many times have ministries missed strategic inflection points in the battle for for lost souls? Well, and that's that's what's I believe in the balance here is there are not only the harvest that God has planned to bring in, but the bondage that's on his people. I think he's He's moving us to deal with. Um, I know that's what I've been dealing with with myself all these years, with bondage and different mindsets. And um, it, it wasn't so difficult getting a hold of, you know, the evil spirits. I, I mean, that, once I got grounded in my authority and I had faith I was able to get on top of that as soon as I could see something but boy changing the mindsets and and 
trying to get trying to get your flesh under, especially if you've been wounded, man, that's hard yes, because it is. because you have a natural instinct to protect to protect yourself. Yeah, absolutely, and that's that's one of the things that God was talking to me about. You know, it's 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 not like there's a a judgment just rolling toward all of us because of we have been stiff necked. It's God's showing us how you can be stiff necked and and ways that we can start praying. Um, because I started thinking, you know, about, you know, the I, like I said, when your neck's stiff, it physically it, it hurts to move. And how many people have been wounded, Mike, and have just stomped their foot down and said, I'm never going to trust again. I'm never going to do that again. It's very easy to do that. Yeah. It's very, you just, you just want to, you know, self-preserve and, and you get, get hurt several times. And especially if you've had a wounded childhood, man, you just dig your heels in. And I know I've done it. Oh, you just it, think, it, I'm not going to do this anymore. I'm not going to be stupid anymore. <laughs> and, and, and that happens in the church. That happens out of the church. That happens uh, both in the pew and in the pulpit. Uh, that, that things have happened that people have been wounded uh, because, you know, hurt people hurt people. Mm-hmm. And uh, I, I, th- I think that I, I think one of the reasons that God's bringing this up now and, and see if this agrees with your spirit. God's trying to bring up our stiff neckedness, stiff neckedness to begin addressing the woundedness that's the root cause so that not only can he uh, avert us from whatever's coming and whatever changes he needs to make, but he actually deals with the root cause to bring healing uh, into our lives. Well, that's it. And, you know, there's some people who have went through such horrible things. And and like we've always said, you know, there's so many doors that God showed us we had open that we were just, uh, Satan was having a field day with us. He was just saying, hey, go ahead and try to fight me. Watch this. Boom, boom. Because we just had so many doors open that we didn't know. Um, And I think a lot of people have went through so much and they've just lost their faith and just don't trust because... um, of something that's happened and they blame God and they said, well, this, you say this in your word, but look at this and look at this, not understanding that it wasn't God that did it. The enemy's trying to kill. He's trying to steal. He's trying to destroy. And he's in there working with a legal right that you don't even know is there. Maybe something that happened with an ancestor and the curse is still intact. The, this Jesus broke the power of the curse, but we have to take authority over what was loosed absolutely because those spirits won't just leave unless you make them leave they're going to just stay there and hound you and hound you because it's important to them that they they get to stick with the bloodline they want to stick with with what they've got they got a lot of legal rights they don't want to lose them they don't want to get uh sent to dry places you know and then satan loves to keep things in secret because then he can keep it into perpetuity yeah that's true. And that's when the light of the, of, the, of the Holy Spirit is so important. Well, and then, you know, we've, we've all been taught some wrong things. How many things can we look back on and think, man, where did, where did somebody get that? Where did, and, you know, all the pagan things that we've all been deceived into doing, yeah. not giving it a thought that it's offensive to God. And, um, and it's, that's one of the hardest things for people to give up. This is like a lifelong, you know, you get your age, our age, um, in your 60s, and you look back at all the years you did something and, and did it that way, it's not easy to change that stuff. No, it's not. And, you know, I I just wonder how many traditions that we have in the church, rather than starting with a revelation from the Word of God, it started with a wound that they molded the Word around to justify the tradition, to justify the act. Well, they have to... They have to use the word of God um, because that that's one of the greatest wounds there is. If they can twist a scripture and, and you think God's done this to you. Mm-hmm. Um, and especially we, I don't think we've totally understood how God is with his will. You know, we've been taught, well, it's just God's will and whatever happens. That, and that's, I it's not true. No, because there's two types of will that are revealed in the word of God, the perfect will of God and the permissive because we have free agency, we have, we have a free will. But you see that the ones that God's really working with, you know, it's like Lot. Lot said, you know, after the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, God says, go up to the mountains. No, I'm going to go over here to this other city, you know, because I'm an old man. It's going to be hard to get up to the mountains and everything. He gets to the old, that other city, and it's just as bad as Sodom and Gomorrah, and they're all afraid. Okay, God's going to wipe this thing out too. And where does he end up? Eventually, he ends up in the mountains. And so you had... 
God's permissive will. But if you're in covenant with him, God will begin working with you to get back to his perfect will. So there are, there are two different wills. And it's, in the, it's when we're in the permissive will that w- that's the most dangerous for us mm-hmm. because we're most open to the enemy because in a, in, in a great sense, that permissive will is accommodating our disobedience because God did not turn us into robots. But at the same time, he's working by his grace to get us back on safe ground. Yeah, that's right. Well, and we, we've always been in a, a particular um, state of flux because we we would love to see nothing more than people be healed and restored. And, you know, I'm a program multiple, so my heart is to see them restored. But in the Ozarks, there's such a high level of program multiples that you, especially if you go the Hebrew roots way. Or the charismatic way. Right, because yeah. they, they have infiltrated so heavily that if you open the doors, if we had opened up... 200 seats, we would have been totally filled up with the program multiples. Because they know we know. And, yeah. and so you can't, you can't have that without a very big balance of some spirit-filled people in there that can help you create the atmosphere to outweigh that. Mm-hmm. We can, you can stop it. I mean, I, I could see... What the people were opening portals. I, I knew what was going on. God was showing me, look at this, watch this. But but you, you would spend your whole time sitting there praying to stop what they're doing. And then you've got to try to convince somebody, you just opened a portal when they don't even think anything's ever happened to them. Yeah. And they're sitting there working in the occult. They're, they're, they can't get up in the morning because they spend the whole night on the astral plane. And you've got to try to convince them something's wrong with them. Now, it's different if somebody comes to you and they say, hey, I think something's happened to me. You know, if you, you want to pray, that's great. But I'm done trying to convince people that they're programmed multiples or that at the very least they are being influenced by something that they don't understand. And it is whipping them around like a rag doll. And that's why this, this decision on the conference center was so difficult is because I thought, God, we aren't, we aren't going to be able to pull some people out of these, these churches that are grounded in the Word. We're not going to be able to pull these praise and worshipers in here and create an atmosphere where you can be, your anointing would come strong enough to, to affect these people. You think, well, hey, you should be able to pray, and you should be able to just loose the anointing on these people, and, and uh, it would all change. Well, if, you've got, if you're sitting there in, in a group of people, let me give you an example. I mean, I was praying and fasting so much in the early years. I mean, that's that's just what I did. I was I I fallen in love with God again. I I was so excited about everything He'd done in my life. I wasn't so excited about what He was showing me was in that place I grew up. But I thought, okay, let's pray, let's go. Um, once Saturday morning. Now this was back when we did services on Sunday, so we had a Saturday morning uh, breakfast type with. Um, the women, mm-hmm. and I, you were doing some with men, and I'd fix breakfast for everybody. And so I was in there one morning, and uh, I mean, I was prayed up. I, I, I knew what I was going to talk about and everything, and I got up in front of those women, and I could not catch my breath. It was like something was just stealing my breath away. I wasn't nervous. I wasn't, I wasn't um, apprehensive about talking to them. And I mean, I, I had to pray through that. And the truth was, is, is all these people sitting there were programmed multiples. They'd been to a ritual the night before, and in they came. And so if you think that you can have a group of those in there, and that's not going to affect things, you're wrong. That's why so many churches get destroyed by them. Mm-hmm. And you, have, you would have to know what you're dealing with. You'd have to have people that knew how to praise and worship. Did you know a lot of the people in the churches have no idea how to praise and worship? No. We were fortunate enough. We went into some churches that said it's okay to lift your hands. It's okay to, to you know, pray in the spirit. It's okay to, to just worship and, and get involved. And, and I'm telling you, most of the program multiples don't know how to do that. A lot, a lot of they, even non-multiples don't know how to do well, that. Well, and they, they know how to perform. You know, I was reading a book by, uh, it was, is it Jeremiah Johnson? Is that his name? I may not be saying his name. Well, anyway, it's this young man that uh, wrote a book, 
and he was saying that he would was, went to a, a church, and he they had a, a very beautiful praise and worship, but the pastor asked him afterwards what he thought, and he said, well, he said, he said it was the, uh, you know, very well done, you know. Lawless execution uh, but, as far as technique. But do you even know if these people are saved? Yeah. I mean, honestly, we, we've got, I know of some mm-hmm. that were in, in praise and worship leading it. They weren't saved. <laughs> weren't and so, saved, had a lot of sin in their lives. But. And, it, and this is not just trying to, to berate people or, or condemn them. I totally understand. I understand, you know, nobody can go through this stuff and, and, uh, and be okay. The problem is, is if you try to help a program multiple, somebody that something's happened to, they've totally blocked it out, and they, they can make their past seem to them like nothing's ever happened. So, so they come in. Do you know how difficult it is to try to explain to them mm-hmm. that you've got demons showing up in your face? It, it, I just am not going to do it anymore. It's, it's absolutely futile. And so my thought is, is everybody needs to examine, look at everything, um, not just assume something's happened to you. It's, it's, I, honestly, with all the people that came through our doors, that was the last thing I was looking for because I thought it can't be this vast. It can't, you know, maybe it's this, maybe it's that. I'd look for everything else first. Mm-hmm. But it was, it was turned out to be that. And there are churches that there's far more program multiple sitting in there than there are the other kind. And there's some churches where it's, it's, they're not, not have been able to infiltrate as much, and there's enough praise and worshipers in there and enough people that, that this, the presence of the Lord is not offended and comes in, and, and then I'm sure that those, those people don't even know what's going on. They probably just leave dazed or something. You know, and I, I look at different models of uh, different ministries. One of the things that really impressed me that I, I thought Jeremiah Johnson would have really liked uh, Jerry Kaufman with the way he set up his church. So, you know, you have like, let's say you're the official choir director. And, and so we, you basically in, in the real, in the average world, you just find somebody that's gifted in music and they lead it because they, they understand that. Well, where, where they up in, where in New York, you had guys that were playing on, uh, Broadway. Okay. And so you talent beyond belief, but it, it didn't matter if you were the, the head usher or if you were the head of the of uh, of the praise and worship team, you were a minister over that team, and that God required you to know where each and every person was spiritually, that uh, they had gotten the sin out of their lives, that they knew Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior, that they were filled with the Spirit, and and that they were being discipled by the director of music, who was in turn being discipled and taught by the by the the head pastor or the bishop which was Jerry Kaufman and so it did he, they actually turned away a lot of people Mary that were let's say playing concert piano on Broadway because they wouldn't go through the discipleship process well there's a difference between talent and the anointing yeah i mean you can be talented we've heard it and but I, the, I, but I, the anointing not flow because they 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 aren't praising and worshiping; they're performing. Yeah, and boy, there's a big difference. Oh man! And I, I remember as a kid, uh, there was one time that uh, during Baptist camp. And this, I mean, this is going back in the in the wee parts of my life, way back before they had cars. Sometimes it feels like <laughs> uh, thirteen years old, and at Baptist camp, and this one girl had gotten saved, and she wanted to to sing a song. And so they, they let her, you know, sing a special. Mary, she couldn't have carried a tune in a bucket, but it was filled with the anointing. Mm-hmm. And so she for, loved Jesus. So for those that were into technical music, they're sitting there saying, thinking, I'm, I'm hearing fingernails on a chalkboard. Mary, she filled that altar with kids getting saved. Isn't that something? Because they, they knew the rough life that she mm-hmm. had. And they could see the presence of God yeah. on her, and they heard the presence of God, and they were running to the altar to get yeah. saved. That's that's the difference. Well, it is, and you know, in in a lot of the prophetic circles, <clears throat> I I'll hear things that my spirit just leaps, and I think, boy, that's right. And then then there'll be something else said, and you think, man, that's not. It is the most bizarre thing to me to listen to different speakers, and you know that there's there's anointing of God on what they're saying. 
but you just you just wonder well are they i wonder if they're a freemason descendant and they don't know that they have to to pray to renounce that because it's like there's a, a that dual stream you talk yeah, about. Yeah, that double stream that we really got to work on in ministry because you don't want to do anything but just give simply what God tells you to say. Yeah, I, that's that's why I'm so careful because it's I mean it's a it's a serious thing to you know to say thus saith the Lord, and that's why I'm I'm trying to be so careful about it. I know I know the real because I got to be in the presence of Marianne Brown, and yeah. I've never seen anybody that. The power of God would just show in her face when she would just turn and give a prophetic word. It was uh, that one time she turned and gave that prophetic word to us. I was waiting for laser beams to come out of her eyes because it was such a so powerful, so powerful, and yeah. you, you could see that her entire countenance changed the moment she began giving that prophetic word. Right. And guys, in in the last days, we need that level of anointing. Oh, we do. We need we, it. We need it because you know I was just I was checking out some headlines this morning and. Um, on one of the sites it said, Biden says Ukraine conflict offers a new world order, alludes to the next great turning in history. And I thought, well, we we know that's what this is about. This is manipulated. And, and so when you've got this level of manipulation, high-level witchcraft involved in this sorcery, and then I read another one, and I thought, well, this isn't going to go over. It said Bloomberg no- News elicited... A massive backlash over the weekend for offering tips to Americans who might struggle with the rising cost of living, which included letting their pets die and eating lentils instead of meat. Well, the lentils are healthy. That's yeah. that's no big deal, although most, most people are meat eaters, and that, that's not going to go for most people replacing their meat. But letting your pets die. Well, Mary, the, the, these people are so hell-bent on creating this new world order that we've been talking about ever since old President Bush was in office, that they're willing to sacrifice 80% of the population of the world to get it. They want to reduce... have no respect for life. They want to reduce us servants down to 650 million. And that, you know, when they start really posting that, that doesn't go good when you have 8 billion people on planet Earth. And... Well, one one person in, um, introduced legislation to try to make it to where you have like twenty one days or something like that after a baby's born to decide whether it should live or not. Yeah, I and you know these things, guys. Listen, we're gonna see some Ananias and Sapphira's events. Yeah, we are. We're gonna see some people get up and say something that so offends Almighty God that they're not gonna make it through the sentence, and we're gonna see it. Because And the reason I know we're getting ready to see judgment on this type of evil and the new world order and all of these billionaires and people that they can just think that they have the power and the money to do anything they want, they forgot about God. And we're, we're, we're seeing, uh, that's just the tip of the iceberg. I remember, and this has been on my radar for almost 20 years, that there were medical ethicists uh, in the United States and the UK way back in the 90s talking about the ability to abort a baby up to two years after it's born. We have one of the guys that was part of the architect of Obamacare that said, after, no, no, it doesn't matter how much you have added to society, paid your taxes, all this stuff you've done your whole life, that after 60, uh, if you have anything to where you're not adding to society anymore, that you should be withheld medical care. Yeah, or euthanize probably is what euthanize. their ultimate goal yeah. is. Uh, you know, assisted suicide or whatever, uh, that these people are, are heartless. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's, I think that's one of the things the church needs to wake up and, and recognize. The war that's going on in the Ukraine is real. It's, it, whenever we talk about false flags, it's not that everybody's faking it. It's that it, it didn't have to happen. It was a created event for a specific purpose in which each side felt like it because they were put into a box that they had no alternative but to do exactly what they have done with with a new world order in sight that they will they will cause World War Three they will cause whatever they need to do they are that committed how committed are we to bringing the kingdom of God mm-hmm. that's what it's going to take how committed are we to bringing in the presence of God how committed are we uh, praying and fasting the way that we should. 
And, you know, one of the things I brought up down in Dallas, when you look at the statistics, uh, and people will rail at the fact that the that 90% of those who did the who did this anonymous poll only have time to pray 15 minutes a week. And that's a pastor. But when you look at it, these same pastors are, are basically wiping noses between 50 to 70 hours a week. Uh, they're being run so ragged they don't have time. Deacons aren't doing what they're supposed to be doing to take the pressure off of them, that they're on call 24-7, and if their congregations expect them to be on call 24-7 even if they're on vacation. And well, there's this all this unrealistic stuff that we're not – uh, we're we're not following the Bible that we have we have we have so drifted away from reality and and the Word of God that things are just absolutely out of out of bounds in so many areas and that's why God is calling us back to return to the balance of the Word of God. Well, and I I'll tell you something's gonna gonna probably ruffle some feathers, but I have been in services like an Assembly of God church, presence of God come. Uh, comes in there so strong. Now they're still doing Christmas, Easter, Halloween, but God, God says He inhabits the praises of His people. There are enough people in there, lifting heart their hands, praise heartfelt praise and worship to God. May be in bondage, may not have everything right, but the power of God moves. I've been in a big group of people that were were uh, Hebraic roots, and not near that. Yeah. Now, now they think they're doing everything right, but not near that. So see, you can have off balance on everything and, and if you're dealing with program multiples you really got problems that's why the hebraic roots at least in the ozarks is filled with it high level witches in some of these places and so that's why i tend to just stay away <laughs> i just try yeah. to stay away do the do praise and worship in our house and when, when you look statistically the baptist church has been invaded by masons mm-hmm. the charismatic church has been invaded by new age and, and, and the occult, and so ha- and you have the Hebraic Roots movement. Many of the um, off-balance people that were in the charismatic movement have rushed to that, as well as those with pro- uh, Mount program, uh, Zion programming. Yeah, Mount Zion programming. Uh, as well as Kabbalists. And there's, mm-hmm. also, there's also all this reverse evangelism going on by Kabbalic rabbis. Uh, that next thing you know, you have these people going out the other side and, and renouncing Jesus as Messiah, and, and guys, we're, we're in a situation that if what we're doing does not draw us closer to Jesus, does not make us a stronger believer, then we're doing it wrong. Mm-hmm. And I, I, there's, a, there's a motto of the Navy SEALs, because whenever you have a, a plan, like this is how we're going to do battle. And in a sense, even how you do church services is like, here's how we're going to do battle. We're going to do this. 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 The truth is that no plan of warfare survives the first engagement. Okay. And so the Navy SEALs have a motto that you adapt and you overcome. That has to be the attitude, the remnant that we adapt. If the enemy is getting in, we stop, we look, go back to the word of God See where the enemy is getting in because we opened a door to them. Well, and that's that's my point about like Assembly of God churches and other good churches that are, are teaching truth and um, are praising and worshiping God. The the fact that I'm not condemning them, the fact that they're still doing Halloween and Easter and, and Christmas and things like that, I'm just telling you God can still move through the hearts of the people. What concerns me is I know what Satan can do with that. And that's why I pray so much for the pastors that I know. And is they don't know that that's a door. They don't know that Satan can come and attack attack their health yeah. and all could cause tragedies and stuff. So I that's mostly what I, I do in prayer is is interceding and saying, Oh God, protect this family. God yeah. God stop put the put mercy over any doors they have because they don't know. And and I think many of them are running so hard because their yes, people are under such attack, but it has gone on for so long that it has become normal. Well, and you know as well as I do what would happen <coughs> if a pastor got up and said, "Folks, I've I've been praying and I've discovered that that Christmas is not um, being celebrated in in honor of God." 
that it's, it's, you know, if you started saying that or Easter, if you tried to start telling them you can't have an Easter egg, you know how that's going to go over. It would be very difficult. We're not putting people down because of that. We're just praying because we learned it the hard way. I, I don't I've, know how long it would have took me for God to get a hold of my head on that if I hadn't seen it firsthand. Mary, I've, I've heard of pastors getting fired over stopping the Halloween celebration. Oh, I, I bet. I bet that's true, and that's one of the easier ones. That's an easy because one. you can show somebody, hey, this is just promoting fear. This yeah. is this can't be of God, but but it's harder on the other ones. Or let's let's change the way that we do the the service because I'm not having enough time to really teach the people the Word of God mm-hmm. and begin breaking up the way that they do things. Inter- uh, I, I think we're going to have to uh, begin having the the yeshivas and return back to the synagogal model, right? that uh, the Apostle Paul not only endorsed, you know, we look at Ephesians chapter 4, we have the, the, the Apostle, the prophet, evangelist, pastor, and teacher. And I was taught, this, this is what I was taught as a Baptist, that these were offices that God anointed the Apostle Paul to create. Mm-hmm. But when you look historically, those offices had been operating in the synagogue since Ezra and Nehemiah established a synagogue back when they were in Babylon. That's why the apostles, when uh, when Jesus said, I'm going to make you apostles, they didn't say, cool, Lord, what's that? They knew because it was a part of their culture and was functioning. Mm-hmm. And that the local synagogue is a house of study, a house of prayer, and a house of fellowship. And you, you have to have all three. And there's very little study going on anymore. Uh, there's more of a motivational thing. You can't train somebody in the Word of God 20 minutes a week, once a week. You can't do it. And we, we've lost our men because they're not engaged. Uh, we, we need to go back and read and, and examine how they did it in the New Testament and how you kept the men engaged. And you kept the men engaged so much so that the apostles could tell the, the jailer, if you accept Jesus, it won't be long that your whole family comes in. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, man, we've, we've, we've lost it. We've, we've, we're, we're not engaging people anymore. And I think that's one of the reasons I got so excited at this conference is to see the young men and the young women that were engaging. Oh, that's so good. And, and, that are, and you could tell these, these guys were, were prayer people. They, mm-hmm. were, they were people of prayer. They were people of the word. They were digging. They were looking for answers. They, they, uh, uh, one young lady, Hope, uh, just, uh, I mean, she, her prayer walk with God is that she will even seek God on what she wears that day, what she does that day, where she goes that day, that she wants to be so led, Mary, by the Spirit of God. And you, you could see it in, in her face. You, you could see it in her demeanor that this is somebody that every single thing they do, they seek because they want to be led by the Spirit of God in everything. Oh, that's got to be so pleasing to God. Oh, yeah. That's what I'm I'm seeking to do. I mean, I've, I've spent so many years trying to get out of bondage that, that that's to me like a higher level walk that I'm I'm seeking. Um, well, I you know I think that what helped me though is I had a heart to praise and worship, and I think as I did that, some of the bondages were just falling off, and that's and that's would be true for any person. You know, if you're if you're program multiple, there's a level of sadness and grief in there that makes it hard to praise and worship. But I I would always cry. Uh, during most of the praise and worship because it it's it's tapping into your broken heart yeah and so those tears just flowed but i just keep on going i wasn't able to have joy and praise like that just you know wanting to run and shout and so thankful and and praising god for his greatness that came after a level of healing was there but i always could worship i could always just just worship him can I share a neat revelation? Sometimes, you know, when you're ministering to people, God shows you something that you would have never thought of in a thousand years. That I'm um, ministering to hope, and there's some other younger people at the speaker's table. And what comes out of my mouth, you know, there was a specific anointing on Henry Gruber. And yes. Henry is for, very precious to us. And, and as I was talking to her, he said, you know, God, when... It was Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and when it got to Jacob and he became Israel, that, that anointing became so strong it splintered into 12 ways, mm. 12 sons, that where we are in history with this next generation, the anointing that was in Henry Groover, and I, I literally saw it just, in a sense, shatter, and Mary, there were going to be thousands that were going to share Praise a portion. God. 
Praise of God. what he did in prayer walking oh, and praying that. over cities. We need that. And I, I, I believe that hope was one of them. I think there were some other ones oh, there. Oh, praise God. That, I can't uh, wait that to were there. And I would have never have dreamed that. But it, it was literally like the light that was in him just this, this went into into these these little sparkles of light that were going, and it was going to reproduce an aspect. Each one is going to have a different aspect of some things that he did, and it's going to be released into this younger generation. Oh, that's so, what we've been praying. So I can I can see the um, the enemy thinking, all right, I finally got that dude in the grave. I finally got him. <laughs> I finally got him off the field of battle, and God was saying. <laughs> Now you get to deal with a couple of thousand of, of oh, people that are going to God. share the anointing of Henry oh, Groover. That's that's justice right there. That's justice. Oh, that's wonderful. Well, I, my heart has always been to see young people raise up that could just outrun anything <laughs> they've ever seen. Just raise up in the anointing of God. And, and me, you know, I'll be one of the ones in the background interceding for them, praying that God protect them because that's... Um, that's my heart is to see them raise up, oh. and I th- and I think that there are going to be um, uh, several ages. You know, when I say young person, I can mean somebody fifty years old. <laughs> yeah, because <laughs> I feel like everybody's a kid to me. I, well, I had to specify when I was down. I'm going to pray for the young people, and I specify in my own mind. Okay. Uh, do I do 40? Do I 35? And the Holy <laughs> Spirit says, start with 35. Anybody 35 or younger, this is what I'm praying over you. Uh, because for us, I mean, anybody 50 or younger are youngins to yeah, us. Yeah, youngins. <laughs> uh, but Mary, all of us, regardless of our age, I, I think this podcast is saying, be adaptive. Don't be adaptive to saint and don't let him change what you're doing. Let the Holy Spirit show you how to overcome what he's doing and be willing to adapt with biblical principles. That's it. That's that's exactly what I think the the whole topic of stiff neckness is about is, you know, we've got the power of the Holy Spirit resident within us to help us not be stiff necked. And that's my prayer. God help me not to be stiff necked. I don't ever want to struggle so much with something God's wanting me to do as I did that conference center. You know, once, once I, we've just had so much bad experience with the, the program multiples and, and the attacks and everything. I just thought, man, I, but see if we got these young people you met, yeah. we got people like that all over the world coming in there. I am telling you, there will be anointing on my cooking because God will want them blessed. There will be. I I am big on anointed cooking because if yes. there if there wasn't such an anointing on cooking, that the occult wouldn't use it so much. There can be anointing on the cooking. There can be anointing on hugs. There there can be prayer for people. There may be people there that are Freemason descendants and don't know what to do. See, that's where I I can just flow easily I'm, i can't stay in atmospheres where i've got to try to convince people they got demons hanging out of their ears i can't do it if somebody walks in and says says there's there's something going on could you pray yeah i will but don't come in there and say i've had a perfect life like like older people there's people older than us i've had a perfect life i i have a great anointing on my life and demons hanging out of their ears it's and it's sad to me but i i have figured out through all these years if they don't want to change, you're not going to get anything done. If no. they're not coming with the heart to, you see anything, tell me, I, I, want to, I want to get rid of this stuff. Because that's what I was. You know, when I first found out about this and read about this, you know what I said? I said, if there's a witch in me, she's going to die. That's just yeah. how it is. She's, she's going I to remember, die. I remember those prayers. Because I wasn't going to allow Satan to have any part of my soul, period. Yeah. And I, and I had my conscious thought has the authority of Jesus. And I could say, listen, hear every part of me. I don't care what's happened. You're going to bow your knee to Jesus or you will never squeak or move in this vessel. We've got to get so enamored with God. We've got to fall so in love with him and and know the wonders of his holiness. And then we've got to hate evil. Yeah, to love God is to, to hate or issue evil. And I don't, I don't want to do anything in the flesh. And we, we, we've got to stay to the place that when we're in the word, that we remain pliable. We do not change the word to match our circumstances. We change our circumstances, and we change ourselves to match the word. And that, that has got to be uh, the heart cry of the remnant. 
Father, bring me back to the word. Bring me back to publicity to where I'm living your word. Uh, and I know I've shared this before, but Watchman Nee, uh, I, I thought was spot on when he said, and it's in his book called The Word, The Ministry of the Word. He said, you know, Jesus was the word and the word was made flesh. And that word dwelt perfectly. It was manifested in flesh, perfect word. And he said, unfortunately, we start with the flesh and we've got to work on crucifying the flesh until that flesh matches the word. That where the, this whole sanctification process is where to become the word, where to, where to begin living and, and teaching and thinking like Jesus did, mm-hmm. that we are all predestined to be conformed and to the image of Jesus. And one of the things that I have found personally, that is when the Holy Spirit goes to work quickly, mm-hmm. is when you invite him to do that. Well, that's right. That's when, when your heart is, is, oh, Father, I want to be free. Yeah. I want to be free to worship you. I want to be free to walk in your kingdom. I, I don't want to be an agent the enemy can use to hurt people through my mouth or actions or anything else. You know, we don't have a right to do that. There are so many people that have had horrible lives outside of being, you know, a program, multiple horrible things, yet they they will not allow themselves to hurt others. And yeah. that's that's a responsibility we have. Now, guys, you know, we're, we're dealing with stiff neckness. So what happened? What would happen this morning if you had woken up and you had a very stiff neck? You would put things on it to loosen it up. Yeah, you'd you? put a heating pad and maybe maybe some of that. What's it called? Emu icy, oil that emu you oil, have that doesn't hot. stink so bad, and, and it'll kind of relieve a muscle strain. You you start doing things to help. The it. natural that you would do that. Yeah, and I, I think right. the natural teaches us spiritual things. That as the Holy Spirit begins to reveal to us places where we're stiff necked, we need the anointing oil. Of the Holy Spirit Lord, in those I, places to I loosen us up. For that. Yes, I Father. ask for that. Show me, Father. Yes. And Father, right now, for every one of us, we just ask that the Holy Spirit would go to work, that He would show us where we are stiff necked. And all of us, every single one of us, are guilty of that in an area or two minimum in our lives. This is a time that the remnant need to learn how to adapt and overcome in every situation. And Lord, I know that you're telling us these things ahead of, enough ahead of time. Yes, thank you, Father. That we can thank get you. it done before the enemy comes rushing yes, in. Yes, thank you for it. And Father, we open ourselves up. Father, we ask for the grace of the Holy Spirit, the grace of the kingdom to give us the grace to see where it is, the grace to repent of it, and the grace to embrace the change that's necessary. Father, let your word come alive to us that we would see the places where we're stiff and we can see yes. how it's supposed to be and how it's supposed to line up with Jesus in every single aspect, Lord. Give us this period of grace to loosen up mm-hmm. where the enemy and his woundedness has made us stiff that we would miss the mark of what you want us to do. Yes. And give us your anointing and your power to adapt and overcome that Jesus would get the greatest glory and that people could see him in us both in the pulpit, in the pew, in the church, and out in the world. Let them become hungry for Jesus because of what they see in us. And Father, we just thank you and we praise you for it in Jesus' name. In the Shinar Directive, we journey down the Luciferian rabbit hole to discover the matrix of darkness that has engulfed our planet. In the Shirith Imperative, we dug deeper to unearth the power source of hell itself and how the body of Christ can labor to impede its functioning in the earth and lay the groundwork for revival. Now it is time to unveil the mysteries of both the priesthood of the kingdom of God and the priesthood of darkness. Until these mysteries are understood, God's remnant cannot realize their purpose or be released with heaven's power to overcome the agenda of the denizens of the second heaven. The Kingdom Priesthood is a training manual for the remnant to discover their priesthood, their purpose, and their service to Almighty God. In the pages of this remnant manual, you will discover what Adam experienced in the first few moments of life and how those desires were written into the DNA of humanity. Revelations of what the Almighty meant when he told Adam and Eve to replenish the earth. Who were the first priests of the Kingdom of God in the Bible? And who was the first priest of darkness? 
What was the knowledge of the tree of good and evil offering the first family of humanity? How we all share the same calling as Abel. The reality of the principalities' wars and how it is influencing the world today. As believers, how we are to function as both a priest and a tabernacle. The real purpose of the fire of God. How to carry the name of God in the earth with dignity and power. How the priesthood is essential for the releasing of end time warriors in the last days. How to flow in the sevenfold anointing of the Holy Spirit to represent Messiah. The kingdom priesthood is a call for the remnant to receive the fire of God and become the assembly that the gates of hell cannot overcome. Get your copy today at Amazon.com or KingdomIntelligenceBriefing.com. That's KingdomIntelligenceBriefing.com. Stay informed. Tune in to weekly podcasts by Dr. Michael and Mary Lou Lake to keep you informed, inspired, and empowered in the kingdom of God. Tune in to www.kingdomintelligencebriefing.com. That's kingdomintelligencebriefing.com. This video was made possible by our partners worldwide. Please prayerfully consider supporting the ministry that is preparing the remnant for the unfolding of end times prophecy. Send your offerings to Biblical Life, P.O. Box 160, Seymour, Missouri. That's Biblical Life, P.O. Box 160, Seymour, Missouri, 65746-0160. You can also donate online at store.biblical-life.com. That's store.biblical-life.com.